All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Morning Skate. This is a huge one. Uh, this is kind of like a pinch me, oh shit kind of moment. But this guy, he spent 16 years in the NHL overcoming adversity and displaying perseverance that we don't often see. Although smaller in stature, he played the game of hockey, one of the biggest hearts of sports ever come across. He's the author of Playing with Fire, the highest of highs and the lowest lows. Stanley Cup champion, gold medalist, seven-time All-Star, point-per-game player, uh, 1,088 and 1,084 games, world junior gold medalist, Canada Cup gold medalist, and one of my all-time favorite hockey players. Welcome to the morning skate, Theo Fleury. I feel like that took an hour just because of like how many, how many awards you got. Well, it's funny. This is called the morning skate because I absolutely hated morning skate. So, <laughs> I mean, that's why we had John. That's why we're doing a little bit more in the afternoon. I love that you hated the morning skate. I feel like, see, I grew up like kind of a fourth line guy. So whenever we would do right. any sort of morning skate, I mean, that was my time to shine to like really right. get pucks right. off the glass, right. try to hit a crossbar, feel good about myself, tell my girlfriend, hey, I might play tonight. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> you know how it is. But th thank you for joining us. Uh, I mean, this, this is this is just absolutely incredible. I, the one thing I've always respected about you is, like, you're you. You don't pretend like you're not you. And you just always play with that fire that I feel like the, the NHL is kind of missing nowadays. But uh, let, let's just hop right into your career, man. I, I obviously pulled up the hockey DB. I have some stuff written down. Uh, you began your junior career 15 years old. Uh, St. James Canadians of the Manitoba Junior Hockey League. You put up 33 goals, 64 points in 22 games. Uh, that next year you went to Moose Jaw, who uh, were in the WHL. You improved your totals for the next four years. So I guess what I want to know is what was junior hockey back in like the early age, especially as a guy who's, who's smaller than what I would think the normal player would be back then. I mean, were you just getting hammered every single shift you were going out there? Like how, how awful was that? And how, how did you battle through that? Well, <clears throat> you know, obviously I, I had, a, you know, a skill – uh, set or level of skill that was head and shoulders above, you know, most the guys that I was playing against, but you know, what, <clears throat> what, uh, what I needed to develop in my game was, you know, the game that you all saw me play where, um, you know, I think when I broke into the NHL or even the WHL, uh, you know, I think the average height was like six feet, the average weight was 200 pounds. And so, you know, I'm six inches shorter and 50 or 50 pounds lighter than everybody that I'm playing against. And so um, in order for me to be successful, I needed to create room on the ice to be able to, to do what I do best. And so, um, you know, I quickly realized that 75% of the players who I was playing against were all bluffers. Okay. okay. All, just all bark, no bite. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the other 25%, you know, those were the guys that I just stayed away from on the ice, <laughs> especially at the beginning. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I became very good with my stick and, you know, that was the great equalizer was, yeah you know, using my stick to intimidate, you know, other guys. And, <clears throat> and, you know, I played with a certain amount of unpredictability too, you know, I'd cut your eye out and it wouldn't bother me one bit, you know? And so guys uh, knew that, you know, those guys would stay away from me because they knew they were going to, you know, they were going to get something, you know, back and that I was not going to be intimidated. And, you know, and all those things. So, you know, I developed this, this style and I, you know, I was a very highly competitive guy. I hated to lose. And so that, in, that in itself would intimidate a lot of, you know, guys that, you know, necessarily didn't want to, you know, put their balls on the line, you know, every night. So um, yeah. And I, and I just continued to get better and better and better, you know, every year that I played, the more experience that I had. And, you know, I, I love, you know, uh, you know, all these hockey terminologies they have now, you know, and, you know, I was a guy that, you know, had a very high hockey IQ, you know, and I, I played the game with my mind more than I played with, you know, the actual skill set. And so, you know, all those things combined, you know, you get Theo Fleury. Yeah, no, and, and I, I feel like 
you probably gained a ton of respect from the, from those 25% that, that would go because you see a smaller guy. Cause normally you see a smaller guy, you toss him around, you do whatever you want, but you have, you finally have a smaller guy who's going to be like, well, you know what? Fuck off, man. Like you want to yeah. do this, do this. And I feel like you probably gained some sort of respect from the rest of the league, knowing that, Oh, well, we're not going to push that guy around. Cause he'll gut us like a fish, <laughs> like, like without any doubt, you know? And I'm I sure. think that's cool. Uh, what was the adjustment period? Like how long did it take you to figure that kind of stuff out? Well, it was, you know, it was that first year of playing in Winnipeg and then, you know, and then, you know, climbing uh, to the next level, right? You know, and, you know, what was interesting was, you know, my first couple of years in the WHL, uh, you know, all of the heavyweights who became like, you know, made a name for themselves, they were all playing in the WHL when I was playing. So guys like the Grim Reaper, oh, Stu yeah. Brimson, Ken Baumgardner, uh, you know, Wendell Clark was around. Yeah, you know, there was know. there was Craig Berube, the chief. Yeah. All those guys were playing in the league when I was. When I was <laughs> oh, my league. God. Right. So, you know, um, like there was a line brawl every night. Which there was a line brawl every night. Yeah, anymore, ever. Yeah. And uh you know we had a few bench clearing brawls too you know and uh and so you know you had to learn how to defend yourself right mm -hmm. and uh and so um yeah i was able to and i played with you know i played with uh kelly buckberger mike keen jim mckenzie lyle odeline you know, we, we had, like, we had probably one of the toughest teams in the WHL. And so, you know, we, you know, we were able to, you know, go up against those teams that had those guys, which I mentioned and, you know, have some success. And so, um, you know, and I, you know, I, I learned how to play on the power play, you know, that's where I got all my points was on the power play. Right, yeah. one less one less guy on the ice and find the open space. You know, so um but yeah, you know, you just <clears throat> um you you try to get better every year, you know. And you know what was interesting was um you know my my draft year, I didn't get drafted. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Oh, your draft year, you didn't get drafted because you eventually yeah. ended up getting drafted in the eighth round, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking up. I mean, you had you 160 points tied in for the league lead with Joe Sackick. You guys you guys shared the Bob Clark Trophy as WHL's top scorers. Mm -hmm. What I loved is you recorded 235 penalty, uh, minutes of penalties in your final year of junior, nearly 100 more than any of the other top 10 WHL scores. <laughs> if you're an NHL team, how are you not like – yeah. dialed in on that guy that makes no sense to me well and uh so i basically got picked in the 20th round of the draft right because the first year 12 right. round didn't get drafted then the following year i didn't get picked till the eighth round so there was 418 guys selected before me right and uh and so what i always tell young guys is it doesn't matter what number you get picked it's where you finish right mm -hmm. and uh you know i posted this on social media uh the day of the, this year's draft and i said you know i got there was 418 guys selected before me and i think i sit 64th in all-time nhl scoring so i said doesn't matter where you get picked, it's where you finish, right? And I finished where, you know, um, so yeah. And, and uh, you know, I had an amazing career, um, was in a lot of winning situations, uh, played with the, all the greatest leaders in the game. I played with them all, you know, Gretzky, Lemieux, Sackick, uh, Messier, Iserman, you know, you name it, that whole entire list of, of great players. And so, you know, I, uh, 
and I loved I love the era that I played in because everybody always says, you know, oh, you'd be great in the NHL right now. And I'd be like, no, I'd be in the penalty box all the time. <laughs> you'd be you know? suspended every other week, right? Like you you yeah. could you can't get away with the stuff that the guys yeah. got away with back then. But I, you know, I, I love the era that I played in. Uh, I think it was the greatest collection of superstars um, of all time. And uh, you know, I I I laugh every time you know uh austin matthews shows up or uh connor mcdavid shows up and i go you know what we had 30 of those guys yeah. you know playing all at the same time you know and so but yeah it was uh, you know it was an amazing uh 15 years of my life and uh and like i said you know uh having all those opportunities to win you know that's what it's all about you know we're we're professionals and we get paid to win. And when we don't win, we should be fucking pissed off that we didn't win the Stanley Cup. And, you know, that was sort of the mentality, you know, back then. Yeah, no, for, for sure. And before we kind of get into the NHL career and, and you winning your Stanley Cup, I wanted to talk about what happened over in, let me see <laughs> how I can pronounce this, P- Pestani? Pestani. Yustani. Okay, so fucking break this down for us, man, because this this is probably one of the most all time watch hockey like fights I think of all time. Yeah. Right? Like, and you're right in the middle of it. <laughs> of course. So, and before you get into it, uh, the Soviets they were out of medal contention. You guys were playing for the gold medal. You were leading four two, and you needed to win by five to claim the gold. And then and then shit pops off. Yeah. So I mean, the Canada Russian rivalry, everybody knows about it. Mm-hmm. What set everything off? Well, I think you have 40, 18 year old kids out there with a lot of testosterone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like I said, every night in whatever league it was, Quebec League, on- Ontario League, or the Western League, you know, we were fucking brawling every night. So, um, you know, the Russians had the worst tournament they've ever had. <clears throat> and whether they beat us or not that night, they were going to finish sixth regardless. Okay. So it's a throwaway game for them. They don't. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the game was really kind of chippy, started out real chippy and, and, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, <clears throat> you know, my line mates were Everett Santapass and, and Mike Keen, who are two really tough guys and uh, Everett sort of, I don't know what the hell he was doing, but the whistle blew and then he sort of squared off with this, guy from the other team and then they started talking i don't know what the fuck they were talking about because one guy's speaking russian the other right guy's... yeah there's not a lot getting accomplished and then all of a sudden i saw everett just fucking haul off and drill him in the head with his glove on and then the russian guy came back and they started fighting and then you know we kind of all went over to see what the hell was going on i got cross-checked from behind and then you know all all, all right. hell broke loose right so is your first instinct there just to find somebody and just and just make sure like yeah. you're with one person then i mean yeah. getting cross checked in the back that fucking sucks you don't really yeah. see that one coming yeah so it uh you know it was <clears throat> just one of those things that that you know happened and uh i don't know if you remember but in the world championships one year uh, uh canada had a chance to win a medal and uh, the Czechs and the Russians played to a zero zero tie so that Canada. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I see. I never knew that. No shit. Yeah. So, there's- <clears throat> and so, you know, like we're the most hated country when it comes to international play because we're so okay. good. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so. But you know what? I, 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 I loved what happened the following year. You know, yeah, bounce back, right? You guys go back there and, and you, and you win you guys gold medal. Right into Moscow. And uh, <laughs> poetic, right? Yeah. And you, like the Russians had a line of Fedorov, McGilney, and Bure was their number one line. So let me ask you a serious question. Your you, coach gives you a pat on the back. All right, it's your turn to go out there and you get out there and it's Fedorov, McGilney, and Bure. And you're, I mean, you're one of the all time greats. I totally get that. But there's got to be a sense of something in your brain where you're like, fuck, I wish I wasn't on the ice right now because these guys can fly. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like, no, there's not at all. 
No. I mean, back then, I mean, it was Federer. It was Federer. I was probably older. It was Burry, the younger one. I don't, I don't remember, but what a line. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we, we had a line of uh, Robbie DeMaio, Mark Recchi, and Adam Graves yeah. as our checking line, right? So, yeah. um, you know, they held them in check and we beat them 3 2. So, on their turf, which is on just, their turf. how pumped were you but, guys? Well, it was really cool. I'm not sure if you're uh, uh, aware of the 1972 series when Canada played Russia for the first time in that eight game series. Yep. Well, there's a very famous hockey player in Canada by the name of Paul Henderson. Mm-hmm. And Paul Henderson scored the winning goal in 1972. And we were playing in the same rink that Paul Henderson scored the goal oh, no in shit. 1972, right? Which started, which started this whole Canada Russia rivalry, right? Yeah. So um yeah, it was a it was a you know, of all the championships I won, it's still my favorite. Yeah, out of all yeah. of them. Yeah, because it's the first time I ever won anything, right? Yeah. And uh, you know. The world, I believe the world junior tournament is the best hockey tournament in the whole entire world. You is there I mean? is there a specific reason why? Is it because it's they're younger players? There's more, yeah. maybe more passion, I guess, yeah. like yeah. less, not less professionalism, but more like they're wearing their hearts on their sleeves every show. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's a, you know, it's the first time you're playing for your country on that big of a stage, you know? Right. And uh, yeah, it was. <clears throat> It was an unbelievable feeling, you know. <laughs> it's awesome. And especially under the circumstances, you know. We were in communist Russia, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, we had 12 first-round draft picks on that Team Canada team. And Joe Sackick was our fourth-line centerman. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god i, I we're gonna get into you winning olympic gold in a little bit and the yeah. roster that you're on with that which is yeah. fucking insane. insane but i mean you were you were captain of that team you finished second in the team and scoring 8.7 games i can't even imagine like were you were you guys at all nervous about any sort of like repercussions of like what happened the previous year and like being in russia uh no 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 one team one dream you guys have you yeah. have it down this is what we're going for all right cool yeah. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was like, you know, the first year we went to, uh, we were actually in Slovakia, but it was still Czechoslovakia at the time, but we were in Slovakia, uh, the year of the brawl. And then the following year, you know, we go to Russia. And so, you know, it, it was re- not only was the hockey amazing, but you know, the life experience was pretty, uh, amazing as well. And, you know, that's, that's yeah, one what are you like 18 years old then 19 years yeah. old I was 19 yeah 18 19 and you know what I always tell parents is that you know the experience is way more important than the actual playing of the game because what hockey does and that team environment is it, it sets you up for the rest of your life you know it really does yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, I didn't play at any sort of high level like you did, but in terms of the the shit that I've learned through hockey yeah. and like the friendships that you make and like how you yeah. treat people and, and battle through shit. Yeah. That makes a hundred percent sense. Yeah. And you know, the reason why we put our kids in sports is to create quality human beings, not professional athletes. Right. Right. Because, yeah. you know, when you look at the big picture, you know, there's only 700 jobs in the NHL. Yeah. And guess what? Most of them are taken. Yeah. Because Crosby has a 10 year deal and Malkin has a 10 year deal and Ovechkin and Kane and Taves and all these guys. And so, you know, we have what, eight and a half million kids playing hockey worldwide for 60 jobs a year. That's all there is. There's only 60 jobs a year. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, we get carried away with thinking that, you know, our kid's going to make it. Well, you know, the math says he's not. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, uh, take it for what it's worth. And that's, you know, those, those lifelong friendships, uh, you know, being a part of a team, 
you know, learning those core values of respect and, you know, loving and caring for your teammates is, you know, that's what it's about. You know, I, I couldn't agree. I mean, all of my best friends, I grew up playing hockey with and we're still best friends to this day. That's actually how we started this podcast. One guy moved to San Diego, one guy moved to Maine and we would just hang out and we'd watch hockey and start talking about it and then just kind of took off. So it's like, it's yeah, that, it, and that's, you know, that's, <clears throat> That's some like life is way more important than playing a game, right? Yeah, hundred you know? percent. And the and the, the game is actually the vehicle which we use to you know create solid people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I just this this game's done so much for me. I don't I don't know if you feel the same way, but the moment you step on the ice, at least for me, all that bullshit that's kind of going on in my life is kind of like my therapy, right? Like it goes yeah. for an hour and a half. I don't have to fucking worry about a thing. It's just. Yeah the puck making it find an open ice and then when you get off the ice all that stuff comes back but for that hour and a half man yeah. you're golden mm-hmm. and uh yeah uh, perfect all right so let's let's move on let's jump on calgary calgary flames drafting the eighth round 166 overall what a joke i oh man i i wish i was a fucking scout back then uh and then you went into training camp you were assigned to salt lake where you began the season <laughs> average nearly two points per game so yeah you you can you can deal there uh <laughs> You, you continue to score and then you end up getting called up. Uh, you finished with 34 points in 36 games in your first NHL season. I mean, almost point per game. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, I have two questions. That's the period. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I guess my, my two questions. Do you remember your first goal? Mm-hmm. And do you remember your first, oh shit, I'm in the NHL moment? <laughs> um. <clears throat> Well, there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to make the NHL. Fuck yeah. So, so when I stepped on the ice the first time, wearing that jersey, I'd already, I'd already been there. Yeah. I'd already imagined it. I'd already, you know, sort of manifested itself. And so, um, you know, what I find really kind of funny now is that you know, when these kids get drafted, you know, they give them every opportunity possible to make it, right? Whereas back in our day, there were 10 guys in the minors that if I failed, they were coming up. Right. Right. There was no, there was no opportunity for me to develop. Right. And so I needed to make an impact right from the beginning right and you know my first game was kind of uneventful we played Quebec and we at home and we beat them and played played a pretty solid game and then the next game was Edmonton Oilers hockey night in Canada welcome to the NHL (laughs) oh man and uh, I scored my first two NHL goals that night no shit on Grant Fuhr I mean pretty good goalie (laughs) <laughs> yep and uh and then the next night we played the los angeles kings at home and i had three assists and so you know basically yeah. from there I, I didn't look back and and then you know six months later we were fucking carrying the stanley cup around the montreal forum so i, I mean know. and you got to play with some joey mullen i think he was the first american to score 500 goals he came on the podcast a while ago awesome guy yeah um, he's the best he's, he's great. the best He's just he, just a nice, nice guy. Uh, Gilmore, Al McKinnis, Joel Otto, Gary Roberts, Lanny McDonald. I mean, those are some pretty good names to have on that team, right? And yeah, like we have, what, nine future Hall of Famers on that team? Yeah. And yeah. and so who was the guy? Did you have anybody kind of take you under their wing a little bit? And who, who was the guy that you kind of hung around the most as a rookie? Well, that team was pretty tight and pretty close, so we – we basically all hung out together. There was really no clicky clickiness to the yeah. team, you know? So, um, you know, as a, as a, as a young guy, as a rookie, you know, I don't think he could be mentored by a better group of, you know, people. And, uh, you know, we, we were a team that we could play any style you wanted to play. You know, if you want to open it up, we can open it up. If you want to, lock it down we could lock it down if you want to drop the mitts we can drop the mitts you know so it was you know we're a 
we were a very well-rounded, you know, team, you know. And when you look at it, your four centermen are New and Dyke, Gilmore, Otto, and Flurry. Those are your four centermen. So it's pretty you know, cool. Yeah. <laughs> have fun to have fun good every time somebody's on the ice no matter what line it is it's like shit <laughs> you know i played with a guy named timmy hunter you know and and uh he was my line mate for the first year and through this the the whole stanley cup playoffs and whatever and so you know he he was a a hard-working guy um you know who knew what his role was knew what his job was and uh you know what was interesting was um, it takes 16 wins to win a Stanley Cup, right? And and what was really neat is, you know, being a fourth line centerman on that team, I got to play against the other team's shitty fourth line. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> out of those 16 wins, our line contributed six game winning goals. Oh, no shit. Right. So, you know, I mean, that, that's such, that's such a gift to have, like as a team or even as a coach yeah. to be able to just put that out there. And yeah. like you were talking about it. And the fact is like a lot of teams can really only play one certain way. Like every year, normally the cup contender is a team that can, has everything. Right. Yeah. But a lot of the teams that make the playoffs, Oh, you're either running gun or you're either we're locking yeah. it down or you, we just have the best goalie in the world. Like the Rangers yeah. did for however yeah. long. Yeah. Uh, and we, yeah. had, we had all those aspects. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's huge. Well, and, you know, uh, from a statistic perspective, you know, we finished, I think we had the number one power play, number two penalty kill. You know, we we're up there, goals against average, you know, the, the whole, you know, thing. And so, yeah, it was, it was amazing. So That's awesome. That's your first year in the show, too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Oh, my God. So after, after that, uh, you put 33 goals in your first full year, 51 the next year. You led the Flames offensively, playing the 91 All-Star game. We're going to fast forward a little bit because I found this interesting. 95, 96, you find out that you have Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. and But you still led the team in goals and assists. And I think you were quoted that you it felt like you're getting stabbed in the stomach like all the time. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you battle through that, man? Like that, I mean, 95, I don't know how old you were, but that had to have kind of flipped a whole lot of things around for you. Yeah. Well, you know, you just deal with life as it comes at you, right? You know? the way, right? But like you said, you said when I step on the ice, I don't have to think about anything. That that that's what it was for me too, right? Yeah. You know, and I was on a pretty powerful steroid at that time too, you know. So that obviously helped, yeah. you know. And uh, you know, I, I know why Olympic athletes gravitate towards taking steroids because when I was on that particular steroid, I tell you, I could have played the whole entire game and never left the ice and, you know, felt, yeah, felt, yeah. Pretty, felt pretty awesome, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I played with a guy named Michael Nylander that year. Oh, and, no shit. Yeah. And his kid is Willie plays yep. for the Leafs, right? And Michael played for the Rangers for forever. I've never seen yeah. a more East West player in my entire yeah. life. That guy gets the puck. He's going to, he has it for, until yeah. he doesn't want it anymore. Yeah. So, and then, and then, uh, you know, we, uh, we brought this kid in, I think we picked him with the last pick in the draft, a guy named German Titoff. And, uh, you know, the three of us really developed some really awesome chemistry and we were, you know, one of the best lines in, in the NHL that year. And so, you know, I think, would I have 46 goals that year or something? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. yeah. 46 goals. Yeah. Yeah, so 46 goals, 50 assists or something, I think. Yeah, and, and you, don't, you don't even feel good. That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Now, I found but this – But it always helps when you play with great players, right? Yeah, people who know what to do with a puck or know different seams yeah. to find and shit like that. The chemistry is huge. You, know, you look at you look at Oaks and Hall and, you know, there's always sort of a, you know, a duo that, you know, play together and, and – play very well together, develop chemistry. So absolutely I mean for the NHL, I mean they're all three elite players, but I look at Boston with like Marshan, Bergeron, and Boston. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The shit that yeah. those guys can do with the pockets. Yeah, it's it's crazy. They're not the same. You developed uh, you know, that 
sort of instinct where you know where they're going to be on the ice. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you don't have to think twice. Yeah. Well, and it, when I was in New York, you know, we had that, the fly line, right. Mm -hmm. Me and Linderos and Mike York, like we, what a great line that well, was. We're definitely going to get to that. Cause I'm a huge Rangers fan. I can't fucking wait to talk to you about, about some Rangers for sure. But I, I, I found this kind of interesting. So new and Dyke refuses to report to camp. You're named captain. You relinquished it two seasons later. Was that a hard decision for you? And I guess, like, what was the reasoning behind doing that? Well, there was a philosophy difference between me and the coach. Pierre Page. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, uh, I just, you know, I just decided that, you know, I didn't want to, you know, any – and, and the, you know, when I met with the general manager, you know, I told him, I said, you know, I just, there is a huge difference. And I think, you know, we, and we had a really young team at that time. And so I said, you know, why don't you give, give the captaincy to, you know, one of the younger guys, you know? Yeah. And, and I think like the whole relationship between captain and coach is like extremely important, right? Because the coach yeah. can't be yelling at you all the time. The coach needs somebody in the room to kind of be yeah. his voice without being the voice. And if you're not really getting mm -hmm. along with the coach or yeah. not like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Good answer. I love that for me. I love that for you. Uh, we're going to move on a little bit to 1999. You're dealt to the Colorado avalanche. Uh, did, did that hurt leaving Calgary? Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was prepared to spend my whole career there, you know, and obviously, you know, the money, the money in the game really started to, you know, take off and, uh, you know, we just, we just couldn't get, you know, we were a really small market team. The, the U S dollar was, you know, worth way more than the Canadian dollar at that time. And we were sort of a small market team and uh you know we just couldn't come to a deal and then obviously <clears throat> going from there to you know basically playing on an all-star team in Colorado was uh you know was pretty amazing is this true that a fan threw you a jersey because your jersey was bloody mm -hmm. and that actually <laughs> you went to put it on you're like oh I can't use this there's a very famous video on YouTube that shows the whole scene so Oh man, we're gonna have to put that up for sure. That's that's it. You, the bench, you get a jersey, put it on. Oh shit, I can't use this one. But when I put it on, it had the whole team's autographs on the front of it. <laughs> oh my god! So I'm like, I can't go out on the ice with all these fucking autographs on this jersey. <laughs> that's incredible. And then you mentioned Colorado. You got to play with Forsberg, Sackett, Lemieux, Deadmarsh, Hayduke, hey Drury, Kaminsky, Foot, Patrick Waugh. List goes on and on. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a big Claude Lemieux guy just because like he, he plays to win. And I think he's always played that way. And a lot of people don't really agree with that because he might do some stuff that is deemed gutless, whatever. And like, I've had Darren McCarty on the podcast. We talked about Claude for a bit. What was he, what was he like in the room in Colorado? And was, was he as much of a pest as what people say he was? Well, what was funny was when I walked into the Avalanche room for the first time, he was the, the, the guy I met first. And I said to him, I said, I said, what are you doing here? To Claude, I said to Claude, what are you doing here? And he's kind of looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, well, it's not April yet. I said, it's not the playoffs. I go, I go, you're fucking useless in the regular season. <laughs> and he fucking laughed. <laughs> but uh, he was one of my f most favorite guys I've ever played with. You know, um, he's a ultimate team guy. Do whatever it takes to win. You know, what does he have? Four Stanley Cups, three yeah. Stanley Cups. A couple times my like. And, uh, you know, that's, that's why we play the game is to win. And, uh, you know, but he's, you know, he's one of those guys you absolutely fucking hate, you know, Yeah, playing um, against. but when he's on your team, you know, there's no better guy. 
That's why I'm pumped we have his kid. And that's the thing. You know, everybody um, thinks that we have the same personality away from the rink that we do on the ice, and it's totally different. You know, it's uh, we have two sort of costumes we wear. You know, when we put the, when we put the uniform on, we're you know, highly competitive guys who hate to lose, and, you know, it's about winning. It's about winning Stanley Cups. And so, you know, and the greatest compliment you can be ever – paid by an opposing player is I hated playing against you. It's the right. greatest compliment, right? <laughs> even fans, fans right? even fans, like you have no idea how many times people come up and say, I fucking hated you as a player. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Did my job. Yeah. Because if you're easy to play against, nobody remembers who you are. You're relevant. Yeah. So that's what I always tell young kids nowadays. One of the first questions I say to them, are you easy to play against? Yeah, you know? and, and, and it 100% true. And I, same thing with Marshan. Everybody hates Marshan. And it's funny because if Marshan was on your team, you would you'd be singing a whole different whole different song. Well, he's, but, got a, he's got a Stanley Cup and a gold medal. Yeah. yeah he, the world hell, right? hell, yeah, he, that guy's incredible. I think he was a third or fourth round pick too. Another undersized guy that – Boston nailed it. So you played 15 games to Colorado, uh, wow, Colorado, uh, and then you go to New York. Uh, you had 15 goals your first year, 30 goals the second year. So here's some names you played with in New York. Leach, Richter, Graves, Darren Langdon. Love Darren Langdon. Uh, Mark Messier and Eric Lindros. Do you do you have some stories about Mess or, or about Langdon that you'd be willing to share? Because I heard a story that when Langdon first came to camp, he didn't really have a lot of clothes, and Messier like, brought him and like bought him suits, and he's like, no, mm-hmm. you're here now. Yeah, that's that's what that's veteran, that's what veteran guys do, right? You know, um, you know, when I got to Calgary, same thing happened to me. A couple guys took me under their wing and taught me what it's like to be a pro. And you know, that's that's what great leaders, you know, do. You know, <laughs> you know, the unfortunate thing about New York, you know, is we had an incredibly talented team, but. Like I said, everybody, I spent three years in my own zone picking the puck out of my net and handing it to the referee. Yeah. You know, we just, we just didn't gel as a, you know, as a team that would, you know, contend for a Stanley Cup. The talent was there on paper. You know, we we're as good as anybody. But like I said, we just, we, we had real, a real tough time uh, playing defense. And, you know, when it comes to the playoffs, defense wins championships, right? Mm -hmm. But what was really neat was, you know, when I got there, there was a young kid named Mike York who they just drafted. And, uh, you know, the, him and I played together the second year I was, I was in New York and played with Adam Graves that year and, uh, developed some really great chemistry. And then, and then they traded for Eric the last year, you know, our second, second year or whatever. And, uh, you know, the three of us, you know, became the fly line and, uh, you know, we, we, we dominated for, you know, especially the Olympic year, the first half of the season, like there was no better line than, you know, the three of us. And it was, you know, just get Eric the puck, you know, that's, that's what it was all about, you know, get him the puck. It's hard to stop a guy that big. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) He was the full package. It, it's so unfortunate what ended up happening with concussions and all yeah. that because I, I still to this day, I mean, Ovechkin's a big dude, pretty powerful guy. He can go to the gritty areas, but I just think Eric Lindros was just yeah. – he was a beast, man. Like how do you stop a guy that big, that fast, who has a little bit of edge to him too that can put the puck in the back of that? Well, what was funny was I used to take his stick in practice – and this thing was like, I could do arm curls with it. That's how <laughs> heavy it was. And it was like, it was like, uh, it was like a steel fucking beam, right? That's how stiff it was. And I couldn't even raise the puck with it. I couldn't even get the puck off the ice with it. That's nuts. Yeah. And this guy's just out there like it's nothing, just boop. Yeah. So, but it was fun. Like, it was fun to, <clears throat> you know, to play, play on a line with him. And then, you know, obviously Mike York was, 
I was a big he, Mike York guy because the, the battle for rookie of the year that year, I think it was Mike York and Scotty Gomez. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I love Mike York. And then I don't really know what ended up happening to him. I think the Rangers ended up trading him. And I thought yeah, he, went to, he went to Edmonton and then he kind of bounced around for, <laughs> for quite a few years after that. So, but uh, yeah, great player, you know, highly competitive guy, good speed, you know, good skill. Yeah. So it was fun. One yeah, point. Well. Uh, you end up signing a two-year deal with the Blackhawks. You finish there with 12 goals, 21 assists. You're put on waivers that March. And then the next year, you end up going to Northern Ireland to play for the Belfast Giants in the Elite Ice Hockey League. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they, they said that you were the best player that's ever played in that league. Was How much fun was that? Well, the hockey was terrible, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, the life experience was incredible. I, I absolutely loved it. So I, I, Ireland's one of the most beautiful countries I've ever, ever been to. It's just amazing. So, and, you know, <clears throat> I wasn't doing anything at the time. You know, I was kind of newly retired and trying to figure out what the rest of my life was going to look like. And I had a buddy that uh, bought, had, had uh, become a part owner of the team and he called me up and asked me if I'd come over there and help him put some butts in the stands and whatever. But uh, yeah, it was Belfast is amazing, amazing city, you know, and uh, the rink, the rink we played in was awesome. The fans were incredible. And uh, you know, I love the history of the league. You know, the, the league's been there since 1940. Oh, no shit. After the second world war, a bunch of Canadian guys married British girls over there and they stayed over there and they started this, this uh, ice hockey league over there. And so, you know, there's a amazing amount of history around, you know, the British, the British elite league. And then, you know, each team had to have six British born players on every team. So it was kind of cool to, to see that, uh, you know, they're developing young players and, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And then, and then you, you had a, a comeback with the flames. You played some exhibition games, wanted to get back in the league. I think you had to make a petition, uh, well, a petition to Gary Bettman to get back mm -hmm. in there. The flames gave you a shot. Uh, I, I, I think you and the GM had a deal that if you weren't going to play top six minutes, then there wasn't a point or something along those lines. It ended up mm -hmm. not working out, but like how important was that to you to give it one, one last fucking go? Like that had to have been huge, right. To get back in there. And that was, what year was that? Oh, nine. Oh, nine. And yeah. that was, and I think, and I was going to talk to you about this afterwards, September 18th, 2005, I think was a very important day in your life. Yeah. So Four years after that, you're going Four back. years to the day. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Oh, my God. You mm -hmm. must have been buzzing, man. <laughs> Holy shit. I mean, how good did that feel to get back out there? And, like, you you still put up points. It wasn't like you couldn't play in the NHL at all. So, yeah. like, you had to felt pretty good about that. Yeah. And the, the whole reason why I went through the process was I didn't want to retire as a suspended player, right? Because – you know, I, I wanted an opportunity to maybe get into the Hockey Hall of Fame, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if I would have been suspended, right? Continue to be suspended. So, you know, the the sort of carrot at the end of it was, you know, I got after I got reinstated. You know, I got invited to to the Flames training camp, and uh, you know, um, you know that first game that I played um, was pretty special. You know, to put the the flaming sea back on and then uh you know have, having the opportunity to you know this to score the shootout winner was that the fans were going nuts yeah it, the well the how many exhibition games are completely sold out yeah right i have a, i have a couple of uh scalper buddies here in calgary mm -hmm. and uh after you know, I got released. They called me and said, man, thanks for coming back. Cause we made a lot of money. <laughs> you know, thanks man. I'm taking those, life on a vacation this summer. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, those two exhibition games that you got to play in, but uh, yeah, it was, and you know, my favorite team growing up was the Islanders, man, you know, when they were winning all those Stanley cups. And so, you know, it was kind of ironic that uh, that particular game was against the Islanders at home and uh 
but uh, yeah, that whole experience was incredible. And, and uh, you know, I, I didn't get to leave the game on my terms, obviously, because of my problems and my issues that I had. And, uh, and yeah, September 18th, uh, 2005 was when I, uh, the last day I had a drink or a drug and, and then four years later to the day, you know, I'm back out in the ice as a Calgary flame. And then, you know, like I said, scoring the shootout winner was, uh, was pretty amazing. I, I, so you know, what was really interesting was, you know, my, <clears throat> my kids, uh, my oldest boy, he, he, you know, was there through my whole entire career, but my two younger kids, you know, hadn't really seen me play. And, uh, you know, after I scored the shootout winner and, you know, after the game was over, I, I came out of the dressing room and, and one of my kids said to me, she, he said, uh, do you know that there was grown men crying in the stands when you scored that goal? And I was like, no, but uh, yeah, it was a really special, uh, special night. And uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great experience. It's cool. Cause it shows how much Calgary meant to you and how much you meant to Calgary at like the same time. Pretty yeah. cool that that yeah, happened. Was, that yeah. Pretty special. Uh, so September 18, 2005, I don't know how much you want to get into it. Uh, the guy who helps me with this podcast, he, he struggled with some stuff. He, figured his stuff out. He's, he's big into mental health and like people talking about it and all this stuff. And like right. as hockey players, I feel like sometimes like if you talk about it, people look at you like, Oh, okay. Like uh, whatever. I think right. it's becoming more recognized that that it, it's a normal thing. Like you, you should be able to do these things. So I guess like, what was your biggest, uh, t I don't know if takeaway is the, is the right word or just like advice for people out there that might, might be struggling because you, you, you've been through hell and back. And, and, and you fucking, you, you got clean four years to the date. You made, you made a fucking hell of a run to get back in the show. Like Theo, that's an unbelievable story. And on mm -hmm. top of that, you end up writing a book about the whole thing, which yeah. not a lot of people would do like that. That's an unbelievable, that shows perseverance and just being able to battle through that adversity and like yeah. not being ashamed and like fucking like doing your thing. It's awesome, man. I don't even know you and I'm proud of you. Like, I, like that's where I'm at. And mm -hmm. So what, what do you have, what can you say to people who are listening to this podcast that might be struggling with stuff like that? Well, the first thing I would say is you're not in the minority. You're in the majority. Yep. Okay. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're living in a really strange time, right? Mm -hmm. And COVID is probably the most traumatic thing that's happened to society since World War II. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And, you know, it's caused us to be in isolation. It's caused us to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, what we're used to is not, you know, is not. Yeah. And it's, I feel yet. like it takes away those outlets, right? Like in New York, rinks just got opened back up and like yeah. that, those hour and a half where like I could go skate and forget yeah. about them. those were gone for yeah. six months. And so, you know, when people struggle with, you know, those kind of things, well, they're going to, you know, we all need an outlet or a coping mechanism to deal, you know, with the emotional pain, which is what mental illness is, is it's emotional pain. It's silent. You can't see it. Right. Right. And so we then tend to gravitate towards the dark side of life and get involved in addictive behavior as a coping mechanism to right. suppress, suppress, you know, uh, what we're feeling. And because we live in a society where, you know, people love to judge one another and all that stuff, you know, which is the stigma attached to any type of mental illness, you know, here we are, you know, where we've had more opioid overdoses and more suicides than we've actually had COVID deaths. Oh, no shit. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that tell you? Right. And so, you know, when I wrote my book in 2009, you know, I wrote it for very selfish reasons, you know, as I just wanted to put all this shit on paper, take one last look at it and put it in its rightful place, which was the past. But what happened was, is that I got run over by people. 
who were coming up at every book signing saying, Hey man, thanks for telling my story. Right. Right. And you know, me too, like this happened to me too. And I so mean, what a feeling that must've been. It was unbelievable. And it really changed the course of my life that writing that book changed the course of my life. And I really, you know, found the true purpose for my life. And I always thought it was supposed to be hockey, but it wasn't, you know, hockey was the vehicle to get me to this point, you know, where I could really find the true purpose for my life. And that was to help as many people as I possibly could who had had the same experience as me. Right. Yeah. Because I was lucky, you know, I can't, I came out on the other end, you know, 16 years ago, I had a fully loaded pistol in my mouth, ready to pull the trigger and end my life. Not because I wanted to die, but because I was completely exhausted from they living tell, yeah. in pain and suffering. And, you know, there was no more hockey. I didn't have an outlet to, you know, sort of um, get rid of all this anxiety and depression and all these things that I was struggling with. And, you know, 20 years ago, nobody was talking about mental health. Oh, not, yeah, not even right. on the realm of things. You know, and so, you know, to have become sort of an advocate and an activist, you know, around mental health and addiction issues and trauma stuff, um, you know, uh, <coughs> really, like I said, set me on a different path. And, uh, you know, I, I, have a reason to get out of bed every day now, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I would, like I said, I've said this many times, you know, I would trade my Stanley cup and gold medal and world junior. I'd trade all that stuff to save somebody's life. And so I've been able to have that opportunity many, many times in the last 15 years, uh, you know, to be able to do that, to take somebody, uh, where I was a long time ago and, and get them on a path of healing and self-discovery and all those things. So it's been, and, been and, and it's, it's, it's poetic. It's like perfect, man, because as, as kids, as adults, you look up to athletes, right? Like they, like they're living your dream. Cause like you grew up, you played all these sports, right. And whether it's right or wrong, I feel like you compare your life to other people. Like at least, at least that's what I do. Like if I'm mm -hmm. sulking up, normally I'm sulking. So I'm looking at somebody else who's having a better time than me. Right. And to see an athlete that you look up to that was tough as shit that could put the puck in the net was a showman. And you can see the fact that like that guy is going through stuff. You know what I mean? And I think that kind of like puts it into like perspective where you're not alone. Like there are a billion other people that are struggling with that. So like, I'm so fucking happy that you were able to end up doing this for people and, and to do this for yourself, man, like that. It's fucking yeah, it's, uh Gives me well, chills, you, to be really honest. Like, you, it's cool. When you get out of your own way, you know, amazing things happen, right? You know, and uh, like I said, the, the my most important work that I've done in my life has happened long after my hockey career, you know, and so uh, I feel very blessed and very fortunate that, uh, you know, like I said, I get to do this amazing work now no i see how you're a pretty incredible human man i don't say that to a lot of people but the shit that you went through and to get through it that's that's fucking badass now i i just have a couple other things you did a country okay. music album yeah who who are you who was like uh who'd you look up to in that realm like who who do you who'd you grow up listening to like what type of artist do you listen to how did that get started like mm -hmm. give me well, the break I, down of that. I grew up in a very musical family so, you know, my grandpa was a fiddle player. My dad was a guitar player. Oh, uncle, yeah. uncle was a guitar player. So, you know, I grew up listening to, to them play music all the time. And, uh, you know, I listened to the old, old country dudes, you know, I'm from small town Canada and that's what we do. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so after I wrote the book, um, you know, I had a couple of buddies in the music industry who were writers and producers and all that. And so I just called them up and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I want to stroke something off the bucket list. And, uh, so I sat down with one of them and, uh, wrote my first song and, uh, the song turned out incredibly amazing. 
And then I just kept going back and we just kept writing more stuff and writing more stuff. And then, uh, you know, we, we got some funds together and uh, went into the studio and recorded, uh, you know, a 10 song album that, uh, um, you know, has been very well received by, you know, by the public. And, uh, you know, we, we gig every once in a while, you know, I have my own band now and, uh, you know, a bunch of local buddies here in Calgary. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. I mean, I mean, what's it, what's your go-to karaoke song? Mm, geez, what is my go-to karaoke song? Country Roads, John Denver. Oh, I love that. What an answer. West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Fuck yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> the best. And uh, yeah, man. So I, I can't thank you enough for hopping on here. This, yeah, this no problem. This, I asked you what your oh shit moment. And like, I always ask people like, what's your oh shit moment. And as this has been going on, like I do, I've got to talk to Adam Graves, Dan McCarty, people I never, ever would have thought that I'd be able to talk to you. And mm. fucking Theo Fleury came on my podcast and talked to me for about an hour about hockey, mental health. This is fucking, this is, the <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Thanks man. Thank you for coming on. This is huge. My, my pleasure, man. It's been, uh, it's been fun reminiscing, you know, um, and you know, and, living in a COVID environment, you know, this gives me something to do every day, talk to different people from different walks of life who, you know, love the game of hockey. So it's kind of cool to be awesome, man. Well, Hey, listen, if you ever want to keep talking hockey, you let me know. I'll fucking talk yeah. your head off for however long. But <laughs> everybody, that's Theo Fleury legend. Uh, thanks again for coming on and we'll talk to you guys next week.